Okay, well, I know this next group will not upset us about anything at all. Uh, so um, now we're going to start to get into some of the, um, the devil is in the details, as they say. And I want to invite our next two panelists to the, um, to the stage. And I will give a short introduction of both of them. One of them's a longtime friend of the center. He's going to moderate this discussion, Scott Hansler. There's lots I could say about him, but I'm going to keep it very short. Uh, he went to West Point. He is now a White House fellow. He's a special advisor to the Department of Commerce. I think he's going to be returning to West Point at some point to continue teaching there. That's, and then we can do some fun stuff. He had a short gig here at the uh, Center on National Security, which was totally fun. He is, was a Madison Policy Forum Fellow, one of our uh, sponsors for today. Um, and he also has been instrumental, one of those people whose name you don't know, but has been instrumental at every part of building the policy and the structure of Cyber Command. And so I think he's the right person to have this conversation with Michael Morell. Now, Michael Morell, this is somebody I've wanted to have at the center for a long time. If you turn on C-SPAN, you got a good chance of seeing him. Or you could turn on the evening news. Um, he's been increasingly the face between the government and the public in explaining what on earth is going on at the NSA that Richard Clark has just told us we need to learn to trust. Uh, recently, he was the deputy director at the CIA where he spent much of his career. But there are a couple of things I want to point out about him. Michael Morrell was with President Bush on 9-11. He was with uh, President Obama when bin Laden was killed. He knows a lot about what happened between, in those two, uh, years. Not just about cyber, but about terrorism. And I've, I've always been interested in the people that take the specialty of terrorism and have moved on, as, as Richard Clark has actually, into the cyber realm. He's a fellow at West Point and at the Madison Policy Forum. He's increasingly involved in all these cyber issues, but what I want to say is he has a book coming out, just <laughs> so, um, which actually looks like something I think we're all going to want to read, called The Great War of Our Time. And I think you can guess what that is about. So without further ado, I turn it over to you, gentlemen. Great. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate it. Um, can everybody hear? Is that the microphone close enough? Good. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time. Mike. It's great to be it. here. Um, can I just say one thing? Please. Um, in the late 1990s, I was an officer in the CIA's Counterterrorism Center. Um, and I worked closely with, uh, <coughs> with Dick. Um, and I was scared to death of him. And when I joined the President's Review Group on NSA, um, I found Dick there, and I was still scared to death of him. Um, now, the reality is that uh, I don't know too many people who have served their nation um, with more effectiveness and more integrity than Dick Clark. And I, I just wanted to say that. Well, I think as Karen said, that I mean, you've got an amazing, varied background of the experiences you had from looking at Asia, so especially knowing the Chinese actor from early in your career to then moving into the CT world and now in cyber, there's arguments to shape the cyber world around the model that CT has used in order to address the threats that are out there. So I want to come back to that in a little bit, but first, to start off more broadly, how do you see the landscape of cyber challenges today. Because Secretary, or, um, Admiral Clapper, or General Clapper speaking before Congress for the last three years when he's given his worldwide threat assessment says that cyber is the number one threat to U.S. national security. What does that actually mean? Yeah, so I disagree with that, by the way. Um, I think that international terrorism remains the number one threat today. I think cyber is gaining on it very quickly. I think cyber is the fastest growing threat. It's kind of weird to call it cyber, right? Because cyber is not a threat in itself. It's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a channel through which an adversary attacks you. Um, so it's a, kind of weird to say cyber threat, but that's what everybody says. But I, but, but I think it's the fastest growing. Um, I agree with everything that Dick said about the threat. I would just, the way I think about it is you got to look at, you got to look at the adversaries and you got to look at the method of attack. 
Um, and when you look at the adversaries, you know, the top of the list, as Dick said, uh, nation states. Um, I would just add one point to what Dick said. You know, he talked about Russia, China, um, Iran, North Korea. The only thing I would point out with regard to nation st states is that there's a whole bunch of nation states that are starting to get into this business um, because they can now buy the tools that you need to get inside of a network and steal information or the tools you need to get inside of a network and do damage. Those tools are now available for purchase on the gray market. So smaller intelligence services who don't have the resources to build their own tools are now acquiring them and now are getting into this business. So the nation state problem, which we tend to look at those four countries that Dick talked about, that's gonna grow in number and it's gonna grow in sophistication over time. And then as you kind of move through the adversaries, right, you've got the criminal groups that Dick talked about, you have um, what I call hacktivists, Right? You've got environmental organizations um, attacking large oil companies because they don't like their policies, they don't like what they're doing. And at the far end of the other spectrum here on adversaries is what I think is the most dangerous <coughs> adversary. It's very easy to go to nation states and say, say they're the most dangerous, but the, the, the most dangerous adversary in cyber is the insider the very person who works for your company or your school or what have you. And either because they get recruited by a nation state to get inside your network, that's what the Central Intelligence Agency does against our adversaries, recruit a human being to inside your company to get inside your network, or just somebody working for you who gets angry at you for some reason and is going to take it out on you vis-a-vis -vis your network. That is Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden was deeply frustrated that the first the Central Intelligence Agency where he worked and then the National Security Agency where he worked did not see his brilliance, did not understand his brilliance. He got angry at that and he took it out on NSA. And boy is the media making him feel brilliant every time they put him on TV. That's what Edward Snowden is really all about, guys. So the other na new nation states in this business, and then, then that insider. And then let me just say something about the, the method of attack. So the vast majority of attacks, right, are the kind that Dick talked about over the internet, from the adversary to you virtually over the internet. There's two other ways to conduct an attack. Right, using that insider that I talked about. But the other is what we call supply chain operations. So if I want to get inside Dick's company and I'm having a really hard time doing it because he's got great defenses, um, I can get in between him and a piece of equipment he's buying and I can put a tool on that piece of equipment before it ever enters his company and I'm inside of his network. So as we get better at our defenses against these nation states, they are gonna move up market to insider attacks, recruiting people, and they're gonna move up market to supply chain operations. So while we're on that then, where do you see the difference between, especially if it's insider that you see as the number one threat, where's the role of US government in that? I mean, if the US government couldn't protect from Snowden or from um, Manning, previous to that, with the WikiLeaks and others, and think that the lessons will be learned. But for the private sector, if that's their largest threat, why does the government have a role in helping protect against an insider threat, or what should that role be? So I think the, the government's responsibility in this case is, first of all, to, to protect itself. I think, Dick, it's Chapter 8 of our report. I think it's Chapter 8 of our report, which got absolutely no attention, no media attention at all. But it's, it's titled, I think it's titled, Protecting Data. And what it basically says is, as we make all these other changes to rebuild this trust that we lost, one of the things we have to do is make sure we actually protect the data we have. And you would think, right, that NSA would have been pretty good at protecting its data. In fact, the great irony of Snowden, 
The great irony of Snowden is here you had what Dick called the most effective organization on the planet in stealing data digitally. Got its pocket picked, digitally. And so we had a whole chapter on how the US government has to get its arms around this problem. And, and half of the chapter was about network security, which is not where it needs to be inside the US government, even inside the intelligence community. And half the chapter is on how do we protect ourselves against the insider. And we made a number of recommendations, right? So I think the first thing the government has to do is get its own house in order in this regard. And then the second thing the US government has to do is, is I think, talk about this as a threat. Because most of the people that I talk to in the private sector about this um, don't think about the insider threat problem. I was talking to a very, very large New York bank um, a couple months ago, and they are just starting, just beginning to look at the insider threat seriously and how do they deal with that. And so I think there's got to be more public discussion about the risks of insiders, and I think that's, th that's a role for the government. Appreciate it. And then so <clears throat> I'm going to shift a little bit of gears to the international part, especially that Dick brought up too about international norms and trying to create the policy of it. And because you brought up data is the reason I'm going to bring this one up now, is the Russians have passed a data privacy law, right, that everything that's on their data protection law, anything of Russian citizens, any company collects, anybody collects anything about private information about a Russian citizen has to be on servers within Russia or the information contained there. And other countries like China and Brazil are now considering passing similar legislation in order to have that. So in the part of creating international norms and development of it, how do you see getting ahead of that curve that what Dick's preposition almost was is that the U.S. has to lead the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dick, there, on the proposition that the U.S. will lead the way of international norm development, but it seems like we're in competition for international norm development, the possibility of a balkanization of the space that's within the internet or other parts, and how do you see them dealing with that yeah. and then the threats that can come from that? So when, when I sat down with Dick and our three colleagues to dig into this um, NSA issue, Snowden disclosure issue, um, I quickly saw it as a problem of three, lo three losses of trust. One loss of trust was loss of trust of the American people in their own government. Um, and we're in the process of rebuilding that. Somebody said that they still don't trust NSA. Um, we're in the process of rebuilding that. That was one loss of trust. Um, that, can be, that can be one back. And we're in, as I said, we're in the process of doing that. The second loss of trust was a loss of trust of some of our allies in the United States government for our allegedly, I'm using the word allegedly sitting up here, allegedly spying on them. Um, I was, I gotta tell you, I was never particularly concerned by that loss of trust um, because at the end of the day, nation states do what nation states do. Um, spying is the world's second oldest profession. Um, I found it interesting that the French interior minister um, publicly said, you know, we do what NSA does, we just don't do it as well, and we're not happy about that. Said that publicly. So I wasn't particularly worried about that second loss of trust. I can't remember, I was in the intelligence business for 33 years, I can't remember a spying scandal that had a long-term impact on bilateral relations between two countries. Simply can't challenge anybody to give me such an example. But then we get to the third lack of trust. And the third lack of trust is a lack of trust of foreign consumers and U.S. business in the United States government. Because everybody thinks that NSA is inside of every American hardware and product being sold. And it's a really difficult <coughs> lack of trust to win back. I mean, this has cost the US IT sector hundreds of millions of dollars in lost sales since the Snowden disclosures. And we haven't taken a step forward in fixing that, I don't think. Um, 
I had dinner with uh, Eric Schmidt of Google a couple months ago, and boy, he was, talk about lack of trust in his own government, deeply, deeply, deeply frustrated in the United States government and what it's willing to talk about and what it's not willing to talk about and transparency and all sorts of things. And we haven't fixed that. Now, we made some recommendations in our report that would help, but the reason it's so difficult to win that trust back, and here we get to the reason why some countries are doing what they're doing, right? Um, the reason it's so difficult to win that trust back is that in order to even have a chance of winning it back, we have to be able to say what we are doing. Here's what NSA is actually doing. And if Dick and I could tell you that, you'd say, oh, that's not that bad. You know, that makes sense. Um, but we can't tell you that because then that would benefit the adversary and the adversary could adjust to it. Um, and even if we could tell you that, you wouldn't believe us that that was all that they were doing with regard to the use of American products or what have you. So I think this is a very, very difficult trust to win back. And I think you're going to see more and more countries head in the direction that you know, we've seen in Europe and, and we've seen in Russia. Now, I have to also say that there is also, um, you know, there's, there's, there's also people taking advantage of NSA's issues and the Snowden disclosures um, for political reasons, right? Um, and you worry about countries like Russia and China and Iran um, putting in place uh, putting in place protections that actually at the end of the day aren't protections against NSA. They are political tools to manipulate their own people. So in overcoming some of this trust potentially, the president has released a bunch of executive orders, the legislation that passed has captured some of the executive order components to it, specifically a lot of the new organizational foundations that the government, the U.S. government's trying to do around cyber to address these threats and challenges. The release the other day that Secretary Carter did of the newest strategy that DOD has, but also the creation of the cyber intelligence or cyber threat intelligence and integration center that's supposed to be modeled off of the National Counterterrorism Center. These different efforts. How do you think that new organizations, when everybody already thinks the government's ineffective in what it does and doesn't trust their capabilities, how will these help overcome those problems or improve at least our effectiveness? And then maybe if effectiveness is improved, then to overcome some of that trust. Yeah, so I don't think they will. You know, I don't think a proliferation of organizations is going to result in that. I think, I think um, senior officials talking about what it is the U.S. government is doing to the extent that you can do that um, is very important. You know, Dick talked about the importance of NSA and the lack of trust in NSA. Uh, you know, when I was at CIA, I learned something as I moved up the chain of command. And what I learned as I moved up the chain of command was that I thought it possible to push out the boundaries of secrecy. In other words, I thought it possible to talk more to the American people about what it is we were doing than we were comfortable with historically. And I thought it not only possible to do that without damaging sources and methods, but I thought it desirable that we do that because at the end of the day, we were a secret intelligence organization operating in a democracy. And at the end of the day, the American people have to have some confidence that we're not only doing our job, but we're living up to the laws and the Constitution of the United States of America. So I think there's a lot more that organizations like CIA, that organizations like NSA can talk about and should be talking about that will help build some trust. And, and I also learned that, that not only can you push that boundary out, but as you push the boundary out, you actually make it easier to protect what it is you need to protect. We had a two, three hour, four hour session with Keith Alexander and his deputy Chris Inglis, our, our little review group. And I remember being struck, and I think we were all struck by, if only Chris and Keith could have the same conversation with the American people that they were having with us. And they ultimately did. They ultimately went on 60 Minutes, and I think did a remarkable job. And if you haven't seen their 60 Minutes interview, you should. They did a remarkable job explaining 
to the American people what it is they do and don't do. Um, I just think there needs to be a lot more of that. So it's not more organizations. Um, it's more transparency with the organizations that we do have. So shifting gears on the transparency a little bit, too, is about dealing with the threats. The U.S. has now made both, again, within a strategy or other parts in the executive order sanction, the sanctions executive order, that deterrence is now the underpinning of what our strategy is developing in the space of the cyber realm. So deterrence generally requires three things, or what the, what the specific threat or behavior you want to change is to not take certain action, the ability to then say this is what will happen if such action is taken, and then the credibility or demonstration effect that you will actually follow through with that. Given the breadth of the economic sanctions order about how all-encompassing it is and lack of clarity to it, as well as some of the other areas of attribution and concerns, is deterrence a real strategy we can have right now in the current state of things? And additionally, since Intel has been the area that's been leading the way in cyber, and inherently there's the Intel gain loss debate that takes place between that and the operational focus side of things to where deterrence is necessary more from an operational side, where should that balance be? Does cyber weapons or tools belong more in the defense space or the intel space? And then, I know this is you know, a breath to this, but then also going back to that point of is deterrence a real viable strategy to have to stop the behaviors that you talked about of threats? And especially since you said insider threats, I think let's focus on the nation state side of that. Yeah, so I think that deterrence is possible with certain nation states. Not all nation states, but certain nation states. But it's certainly not possible with cyber criminals, certainly not possible with hacktivists, certainly not possible with those insiders, right? Um, certainly not possible with terrorists, by the way, who surprisingly have not shown a particular interest uh, in cyber attacks um, to date, although ISIS is poking around uh, a bit in that area. Um, terrorists like to see things blow up, um, but I think you'll see more of that over time. So I think it is with nation states, but I, but I think in general it's going to be very, very hard. So, uh, go ahead. Or no, go ahead. So I was going to say on the question of, um, you know, intel versus defense, you know, uh, I was with a company a couple of weeks ago and they said that the FBI had shown up at their door and told them that they were under attack by a nation state, um, but would not tell them any more information than that. Um, and, 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 uh, and Dick mentioned this, right, as an issue too. Well, the problem, right, the problem is, you know, what Dick said is that what the U.S. government sees is, is, is either the attack or the exfiltration of the data, or both, right? And they use intelligence tools to see those two things. And if you start spreading around too much how you know something, and the more information you give, the more at risk you put the how you know, um, you, put those tools, you put those tools at risk, right? And that's the struggle here. Um, how much information do you give the defender so that they can defend themselves while still protecting your ability to collect it in the first place? Right, because if you can't collect it, you can't. There's nothing to share. So there is, there, there will always be this tension. You know, we, we used to see this, still do probably see this tension in counterterrorism. Um, do we disrupt this particular thing now and lose our window into it, or do we wait and see more and see if the cell is bigger than 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 what we see now and disrupt it later and take the risk? So that tension is always going to be there, and it's going to get worked out in the sit room in the White House. Um, and, you know, by hopefully by people who think about all the different aspects and all the different angles of it. Do you think that contributes to some of the lack of trust that the businesses have in the government's ability to help? I mean, I know that some of the companies appreciate when the government tells you that you've been hacked. But for an example, like FSISAC, the foreign ser or <laughs> Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Group, has done a great job where the private sector, in partnership with government, have taken care of themselves and the executive order has been modeled around that. But what you'll hear from a lot of the private sector is that whatever the government gives us, we already know, right? That none of it's actually of value or the other part because they always have these intel gain loss arguments where it gets classified at such a higher level that it's of no value to them and they're already aware of it. How do you start overcoming that and giving the private sector an ability to take care of itself in ways that sometimes they do want to do and tools that are helpful to them? 
Look, it's really hard, and you know, um, I share Dick's view that there are a whole bunch of issues here that I don't have the answer to. Uh, you know, we are we are just at the cusp of working these issues. Um, this is not dissimilar to sort of where we were in the 1950s on nuclear weapons. Um, in fact, I think there's a lot of similarities um, in the the degree to which people are, are are concerned about cyber, right? I mean, it, it's at a fever pitch now as a result of Snowden, as a result of Sony, as a result of, of you know, Target. There's, it's, it's kind of at a fever pitch, and people are almost over-worrying the problem. Um, just as people built bomb shelters in their backyard um, in the 1950s because they were worried about nuclear weapons. Um, so I think there's gonna be, there's gonna be some settling out. Um, you know, I actually think companies might be spending too much money on cyber defense, not necessarily all, always spending it where they should. Um, some of them are spending it where they shouldn't. Um, but there's an awful lot of money being spent, and I think there's going to be some settling out, and I think there's going to be some working through of the policy. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping there's going to be some norms, international norms, that we can come to. It's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard. Um, but we're just at the beginning of this, and this is going to be a significant work in progress. I would think this would be on the top five things a new president wants to tackle on the national security side. So speaking of that, like, what to tackle next and thinking through, and then you mentioned Sony, and Dick mentioned that Sony is what was the final tipping point that got the U.S. together. Why was the Sony attack a national security threat? I mean, it was embarrassing to some CEOs that still the trickles of the emails that keep coming out about which actors did what, and the movie got released early, and some other IP pieces to it, and you hear about destruction, but not on the scale of 30,000 computers by an Aramco wiper. What was actually destroyed other than the computers were messed up because they were already done. But so why was it a national security threat? Yeah, I think the importance of the Sony, um, the Sony attack is twofold. One is um, it, did, it did lead the company to change a decision it had made, right? That's political blackmail. You know, that's, that's, this was an act of terrorism in my book, right? Because terrorism is, the definition of terrorism is violence for political purposes. They destroyed data, that's violence and it was a political purpose, and they were successful. And I think that, that in itself is a, is a, sets a precedent for other, other adversaries to look at and say, hey, that's interesting, they were successful. So I think that's one reason you wanna push back really, really hard on that. The other is North Korea itself, because prior to the Sony attack, North Korea had largely been involved in denial of service attacks against South Korea. And so they showed an increased capability um, that they had not showed before in terms of data destruction. Um, and so another example of somebody moving, moving up market in terms of sophistication that I think we have to worry about because an attack might, know, might not just be against Sony, it might be against something more critical to the United States national security. So if, if it was about political blackmail or terrorism by your definition there, that data destruction would count under that form of terror. I don't know if it would, but, but I can. No, I mean, but just making the argument of it. Then the next step to take that then, hasn't it, have other countries potentially now learned that political blackmail pays? Because Dick said that Seth Rogen movie is now the new red line, but what happened from that red line? The president said that at his time and place of choosing, then something will take place. The further you get away from an event, then the time in choosing, you lose sight of what you're actually trying to deter and people forget what the cause of that reaction was, of that demonstration effect or anything else. So where, what's so you, the lesson to take away for other actors about the cyber attack that Sony So you did? talked about the three components of deterrence yeah. earlier, right? Yeah. Well, we did, not, we did not do those three pieces of deterrence in this case, right? So the lesson learned is it works. I think that we're, where's Karen? We have a couple minutes or we have time for a few questions, a couple, two, three questions from the audience and then we'll be there. Thanks for everything. Sorry, I have two points. Do you wait for the microphone? Sorry, I think someone's gonna run over with the microphone. Gentlemen, I have two points to make. I hope they're useful and that's the purpose for recommending them. One, you recommended that cyber attacks have no 
<clears throat> the bad actors have no place in the cyberspace right now. What happens is there is a message there, which is a harmful message, and you understand better than I the, the harm of that message. But I think the, the balance of free speech and allowing people to, to have an accountable line in free speech as the Supreme Court has, there's a balance of what is free speech and what is not. Um, <clears throat> apologies for speaking up, but I think there is a risk there in allowing people to speak in a way that recommends the harm of other people. I think that that specific line may be more of a risk that's not considered enough. And on um, one other point, there was the, the question of Sony, and I think there's two hidden issues in there. The one is the free speech, because Sony's right, and what we value as a free society is the ability to, um, sp to speak out to things, to critically talk about things, and art and entertainment has always been a way that we're allowed to express these things, and back to the Cold War and other points, it's been a forum where we can express our feelings, meet, and um, you could say art is a metaphor, where we meet some of our ideas, we face our fears and challenges in community, but that expression vehicle and the freedom of that is very important to who we are together and the ability to have an open forum and to be the voice of freedom and liberty, which I think is critical and underappreciated in those lines. I think that is an element of cyber that I'm not hearing about, and I would value your opinion on that. And the one other piece of that is that the IP assets of Sony in the, in the economy, a part of cyber risk, if you will, is that we have a lot of IP assets, and those IP assets were mentioned by Mr. Clark in the beginning, that bad actors go in, they take the information for economic gain and purpose. That happens in a specific region, and it is a bigger risk because I think we underappreciate intellectual property. We appreciate the value that it helps us on business and development, but I think the other side of that risk is that that is the knowledge capital that a lot of people um, build with sweat equity, and for those people that believe in sharing and growing with it, I think that's an important line. But it's also an important line to think about how do we protect the creative segment of our economy that has an important role in free speech and protecting the values that, that are central to us and seeing that as risk. I'm sorry it was long winded. No, no, I appreciate it. No. Yeah, just two quick comments. Just two quick comments. One is, um, you know, I, on, on Sony, I agree 100%, I, and I should have mentioned it. Uh, you know, the attack was an attack against our very values, right? Um, and and, and that, that made it um, vitally important. The other point I'll make is, is you know, it was my job um, as an analyst at CIA to provide the president with the other guy's perspective, with the perspective of the adversary. How does an adversary think about this, right? Um, and one of the reasons that, and, and and so when you think about North Korea, they don't have the same values that we do when it comes to free speech, right? So th that's not even, they can't even comprehend that. Um, but that's one of the reasons why getting to international norms on, on stealing intellectual property is gonna be very, very difficult because I guarantee you that the Chinese define national security to include the, the health of their economy, and they see their role as helping their companies, right? So they link the two. They, they see a direct link between stealing intellectual property, giving it to their companies, and national security. So if we say, look, let's, 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 let's only do cyber for intelligence purposes for national security, they're going to say, great, that means we can do, that, that means we can do, we can steal intellectual property. So, you know, they've got a completely different perspective on this than we do. We're done. Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome.